Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Veltima Fungicide and Pride Seeds. Welcome to the Corn School. I'm Bernard Tobin. I am down at Ridgetown College today catching up with Dr. David Hooker. We are in the corn nursery, the misting nursery. Dave, thanks for the invitation. Uh, thanks for being here. Awesome. Hey, now, I, I've seen you walking through this nursery over the years. We've shot videos here. Talk about what you're trying to achieve here, what you're doing here in the nursery. It uh, really is about disease assessment. Gibberella mycotoxins? Well, this trial that we're in, that we're standing in, it has really been a long-term trial. Like, this has started, this trial really started, it was initiated in 2019. Mm -hmm. And after the 2018 epidemic, the corn industry, leaders of the industry, we decided we have to do something, something different to manage this disease. And in corn, with gibberella ear rot, it's the mycotoxins that are produced from the disease. And so we're looking at you know, different agronomic practices, um, a hybrid selection, and uh, fungicides, uh, application technology. And so all of those technologies need to be integrated like we did for wheat. You know, after 1996, we needed to do that for corn. And that's when all of these experts sat around the table and we decided we need to do something. Right. And this is a hybrid, we call it a misting trial, mm -hmm. where hybrids are misted with water to produce a favorable environment for the disease. We make sure that the pathogen is present. So each ear is inoculated by hand with the pathogen that causes uh, or that produces um, uh, myco uh, mycotoxins, um, DON or deoxynivalenol. And all that we have left is to, com to compare are the hybrids. And so that's what we have in this trial. We have uh, multiple hybrids that we're comparing. Talk about, I guess, the data or the uh, research and, and, and I guess the management tips that come out of here, Dave. Um, do you weed out the, the, no, the, the, the bad varieties, keep the good ones, group them, make recommendations? How does it go forward? This is 2022, and so we have six site years of data mm -hmm. for this. And the problem is, uh, is that we have tremendous environmental influence as well. Mm -hmm. We have temperature that plays a big influence, and so what we've done um, to um, reduce the variability in these hybrid ratings is to plant three planting dates. All the hybrids that we have in here, we have 60 hybrids mm -hmm. that were um, donated or submitted by companies for information. And we have three planting dates and it's all replicated. And so at the end of the season, we harvest the ears and, um, and then uh, analyze them for a mycotoxin. And I guess it's the body of evidence that we have um, that would, what would make us say that one hybrid is um, highly susceptible to mycotoxin accumulation versus another group of hybrids maybe that are kind of resistance or mm -hmm. don't show, like don't have this body of evidence um, of, of accumulating mycotoxins. So it's about, I think, grouping hybrids yep. more than just um, ranking hybrids from one to 60, mm -hmm. say. And that, that's what our goal is. We wanna look at a group of hybrids and, and maybe weed out those ones that are highly susceptible and growers need to know that. Yeah. Final question for you and that is, you know, obviously you, you have new data Data coming every year. How does that get compiled this winter and what should growers be doing with it and looking at it? How should they be looking at it and making decisions? Yeah, well, this is, um, I think, the challenging part. Um, this is way more than one person could ever analyze all of this data. And so, in fact, we need a group. We have a team of individuals, of experts, that sit around the table and we will sit around the table and look over all of the data that we've had in the past years and then we will just compile a body of evidence that would show this grouping of hybrids, they have a tendency of producing more mycotoxin than this grouping does. And that's what our prime objective is. And just to, um, I guess, collaborate and just agree on um, that this group has a, um, a, a higher susceptibility for mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of challenging because around the table, of course, we have members of the seed industry, some of their hybrids might be in that group and um, but we need to come together and uh, and make a decision, the best decision that we have for growers. And so this takes time. Uh, that takes time, and we're hoping to get this data uh, out of the field, all that analyzed and uh, data analyzed, and hopefully something 
will be um, produced around Christmas time, I'm hoping. And then in years forward, in the future years, after we've refined all of these techniques, this information would flow much more easily. It's just this initial, um, um, I guess, a flood of data that we really need to do a good job and do it right from the get-go. Okay, I'm now over in a different part of the nursery. We were looking at commercial hybrids and how they're rated for disease. I'm now joined by Omafra's plant pathologist, Albert Tenuta. Albert, this is different here. This is, this is the future. This is new germplasm. This is new genetics, right? Yes, absolutely. And this is a different objective. You know, Dave Hooker and myself, along with Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, corn breeder, Ida Kabidi, are looking at public germplasm and their tolerance and resistance to, and susceptibility, of mm -hmm. course, to, to gibberell ear rot and dawn production. Yeah, so you evaluate hybrids here and, and, uh, and inbreds. Now, you've got some good stuff and some bad stuff, and some of it's going to make it over there, right? Absolutely. The goal is to go from here to what Dave was just talking about, getting into those hybrids as well. And so besides Ridgetown, same um, format um, is in Ottawa as well. And so as you mentioned, we've got some good, we got some bad. If you look at this inbred here, or germplasm, you can see our typical gibberella erot and now dawn production more than likely. And again, these are inoculated and that's one of the benefits mm -hmm. of this system as Dave mentioned, having the inoculation as well as the favorable environment. Mm -hmm. This other germplasm or other line here, you can see looking sharp, clean, do not see anywhere in this row any indication to gibberell ear rot, and that means probably less dawn, if not no dawn. And so how do we get this into those? Yeah. So that's the, that's the final question here. That is. How do you do it? How long does it take? What type of effort? Yeah, so with the, with the crossing and, and that, it takes quite a bit of effort. You know, whether it's a public breeding uh, program or the commercial uh, corn hybrid companies, it's usually, you know, you're looking four, five, eight, ten years down the road. It depends on the germplasm and how to get that into those high-yielding, adaptable corn hybrids for Ontario. Well, a disease protection is a big job. Albert, thanks for taking some time for Real Agriculture. Always great to have you on the Corn School. Thank you so much.